Hi guys, welcome back to the Nevermind Poly Podcast. My name is Matt, I'm your host, and we interview rock and metal bands from around the world. And it's my absolute pleasure to bring you this interview this time around. I've got the guitarist of the band Onslaught. I'm sat down with Nige. How are we doing, sir? How's things? I'm I'm, uh, I'm very good, thanks. Not too bad. Good, good, good. Um, So first and foremost, I want to say a massive thank you, as I said previously, uh, just a second ago. This has taken a moment to get on. I've been sort of uh, chasing you for, for, for a minute and things to try and get this sat down. So I'm really glad we finally get to do it because I'm a big fan of Onslaught. I mean... Um, thrash metal is just a fucking thing I enjoy, just in general. It's it's one of the things where it comes on, I'm like, yeah, this is fucking sick. And, and you guys are a band who are on my regular rotation. But um, I wanna I wanna start things off by sort of saying, how's um how's life treating you at the moment? How's everything going? Is everything all okay and things? Um, I've had a pretty rough year personally. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but I haven't played any shows for the past fourteen months. Okay, um, for sure which is not cool for me. Um, the band has still been kind of forging ahead to keep things moving, you know, um, without me. Yeah. Um, I had um, a compressed nerve in my spine. Oh, fuck. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I think the last show I played was in uh, March 2022. Okay, um, for sure. And I noticed something going on kind of at the end of that show. My arms had got really tired. Mm. I was struggling. Um so I went to see some um, medical people, had MRI scans, and, and found out uh, this trap and everything. So um, oh, yeah. eventually, after a year, I think I had an operation, 27th of April, um, mm-hmm. basically eight or nine weeks ago. Yeah. So still in recovery mode. Mm. Um, I don't know how long it's going to take. Yeah. But um, I've noticed some improvement already. Um, yeah. So I think I'll start physio in about three weeks' time. Yeah. Your fingers oh. crossed you can kind of make a good recovery then. Absolutely. And that's the thing as well. So I, I can only liken the, the so I, I've had like um a slip disc before, which I know yeah, is a slightly yeah. different thing, but I know how excruciatingly painful that is. So yeah, yeah. um sending lots of po- uh, positive vibes and love and, and, and good wishes on that respect to, to begin with. But yeah, um thanks. Yeah, it must be a, a really hard thing in that respect then because, like you say, being being a musician and being a creative person and being a guitarist, you've got a guitar to your, to your right of you at the moment. It must be difficult to be able to not be able to pick up and play this thing that you love to do, that you have done for the last 40-odd years or so. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's been horrible, especially seeing the guys on stage, you know. <laughs> it's yeah, kind of, yeah that's absolutely. Kind of um, but no, I was, I was limited. I couldn't get to the end of the guitar with my arm. I think probably reach up to the like maybe the, the fifth fret and that's as far as it would go Bloody hell. But literally the day i came out of hospital um i picked up a guitar just to see what would happen yeah. and immediately i could reach the end of the guitar which i thought wow that's something's happened already so yeah oh that's really <laughs> that, that's really positive then that's that's definitely a, a good thing that's a good thing um yeah I wanted to kind of, um, as I say, because of the album coming out in 2020 and things, but you guys being such a, an influential band on my personal taste in music, and it's my podcast and things, so I can kind of make my own rules up, it's kind of like, I wanted to have you guys on. But also, it was uh, 40 years of Onslaught being a band uh, last year, which is yeah. a really, really uh, incredible landmark. How does that feel? Uh, obviously, now it's obviously now 41 years, but how, how have you kind of uh, sort of, yeah, navigated that. And how's it been? Um, it's mad to think of it being 40 years. I mean, it, it still seems like yesterday mm. when we started, you know, I can st- still got so many fresh memories of that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it's been an incredible journey, um, which we're, we're going to kind of document soon. Mm. Um, it, it was supposed to happen last year, but obviously because of my situation, it's, it's really kind of, mess things up in in terms of that but um we're gonna do a, a special double album release um, oh, amazing which is gonna be this year or very early next year obviously that was to celebrate the 40 years but um yeah. that's not happening i so we're we're a little bit behind but it's gonna be a kind of a documentation of uh the early years of onslaught if you like um with some re-recordings of um some classic stuff from back then yeah and more i think more importantly on that thing is going to we're going to cover a lot of um a lot of bands who influenced us and and explain the reasons why we're doing these covers and and what they did for us back in the day you know so i think it's going to be a real 
interesting thing for the, the hardcore fans in particular. Absolutely. And so I recently sat down with um, with Andy from Therapy, who uh, had to postpone their 30 year anniversary because of COVID. So I can, I, again, it's, it's a similar contrast in, in just being frustrated because it's like, you really want to just like, like I say, 30 years, 40 years, it's a monumental <laughs> uh, achievement of, of any kind of uh, band and thing. So it's really cool. I want to, obviously you touched on the early kind of days of the band. I wanted to go there if we can just for a moment because I think it's really interesting to see where people's love affair with music started. Where does your love affair start with music and how did you get into playing guitar and music and things? Uh, I, I was always interested in music from when I was little by all accounts. Um, yeah. Parents used to tell me that when I was three, four years old, I can't remember it myself, but yeah. I was... A, really mad into the kinks by by all accounts amazing <laughs> yeah. so which are, i guess they were the kind of forerunners of kind of heavier rock music i guess which yeah. was kind of interesting when they told me that and i just followed music all the way through sort of 70s you know um and then punk came along when i was in my early teens yeah of course that, that was it then once i heard the uh sex pistols and the stranglers that was me hooked yeah, absolutely. For like properly into music then. So, um, love that. Music just became my life for that. And just buying records and seeing bands everywhere. And just things like snowballed from there, really. Absolutely. And that's the thing. It is a lifelong obsession. Uh, I don't care what anyone says. Once you're in, once you've once you've got your first taste of rock and metal and, and rock and roll in general, it's kind of like you're in for life and you're you're here for yeah. it. So it's all good. Um, so seven studio records under the belt uh, with Onslaught, uh, the latest being the 2020 uh, effort Generation Anarchist. How was the reaction to that record when it first came out? And how do you feel about it now it's been out in the world for a couple of years and things? Um, the reaction was amazing. Um, obviously, we, we we were kind of ha- apprehensive. We we knew we we'd made a, a great record, or in our opinions, anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, with with a change of vocalist mm-hmm. at the time, yeah, you're you're always gonna, especially when with Cy leaving the band. Yeah, we're very concerned, obviously. But but Dave just came in and just tore it a new one. You know, um, yeah, absolutely. The, the response to, to Dave was incredible. And I just listened to some tracks the other day, just sort of easing myself back in mm-hmm. uh, where Dave did such an incredible job. Like uh, he really stepped up to the plate and, and matched side pretty much. And, and it, it made things a lot easier for us because he did such a good job that nobody even kind of focused on, mm. on the fact that side had gone and what I mean, they just um, focused on the music, which, got an absolutely amazing response and that that's um, that's the best thing as well isn't it sorry just to cut you off I, I think that's the thing when people look at uh lineup changes or whatever else or or uh different like if an album's a bit of a drop off in comparison to a, the previous one whatever it may be it's always about the music so that that makes that's perfect sorry carry yeah. on <laughs> yeah i mean it, it, it like i said it helped us a lot and we had a we had a great teamwork on that record and, and really got the best out of it because we knew it was going to be a challenge yeah, of course. Um, but the songs were there, and, and he delivered massively. And the reviews for the album and the response from the fans has been incredible. You know, um, just a shame that we haven't got to tour it properly yet. But um, <laughs> I'm yeah. sure we get around to doing something for it. Absolutely, absolutely. That makes um that makes perfect sense. Uh, I love that, and that's the thing as well. It's um having a, a new member of the band and is is hard enough, but having a new front man is you know the the centerpiece. Uh, some would say of a band is is a real thing. So how how do you think he stepped up to it? How do you think he kind of uh, dealt with it? And did he uh, well obviously stepped up to the plate because he's still in the band and still rocking it. Do you know what I mean? But <laughs> <laughs> he's he's been absolutely amazing. You know, he's brought a whole new whole new energy to the band yeah um on stage he's fantastic and he, he deals with with the crowd so well you know yeah. it's just such a smooth transition i mean Cy was amazing as as everybody knows yeah of course but, but dave's come in and, and made it his own you know um and he's been out of this world um yeah. so yeah i mean he's, he's a lovely guy as well which which oh, helps well i was about to say always helps when you've got a nice front man yeah, or nice yeah, any yeah. member of band it always helps doesn't it <laughs> It's just been so smooth, and he's been fantastic stepping in for me because obviously he plays guitar as well. Yeah. So sure. instead of getting somebody else in a different face, we just decided to keep it go to four piece with Dave singing and um, playing guitar. But it kind of compromises the live show a bit because he's 
he's got a lot of energy on stage and likes to to, yeah. to run around a lot and sort of cover the stage. So he's kind of tired at the moment, but um, but yes, as I said, he's doing an amazing job um, stepping in for me now. Yeah, absolutely. So as as we've already already touched on, um, forty years in the game, I want to take you right back to Power from Hell. Yeah. Because, and this is such a broad question, and I apologize. When I wrote it, I was like, this is such a broad question, but I needed to ask it. Um, how has things changed uh, since that record in comparison to 2023? And you can take that from a, different, a couple of different uh, responses, like from a writing process, from the live shows, from just the equipment you play and how you perform nowadays. How has things changed since the early days? And is it changed for the better? Um, lots of change, lots has changed, and lots haven't changed, you know? Mm-hmm. Of course. Um, I remember I, I quit my job. <laughs> it's yeah. a bit of a gamble. I mean, we just just had a record deal. I quit my job to write the record. <laughs> sure, amazing. Which, which was kind of random, you know. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, the, the in terms of writing, I still write the same way. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've, I've gone kind of back full circle. The the, um, the instrument or the the amps I'm using now are. Uh, are very similar to what I used back then. I've gone full circle, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's kind of the same. Um, obviously, the technology of recording is a lot different now, which helps mm. vastly with budgets and and the way you can make things quickly, you know. Yeah. Um, but now I mean a lot has stayed the same, which is which is kind of cool because it was a great era. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, and I think that's the thing as well. I think it's testament to. To you guys as a band because you put on those early records and they sound just as good as the new records only just if more a little cleaner in the terms of the production just yeah. because of the techniques used and things like that but it's still fucking ripping which is which is super cool um i wanted to to touch on um the so v1 or six in roman numerals uh the album's released in 2013 there was a, a sizable gap between 2013 and 2020 uh with the records and if do you, do you, is there was there a reason for that? Have I missed that for my notes? Or just from a curious curious standpoint, really? I mean, I think what, what year was that? Two eighty six. I think two thousand and sixteen was the what that have been like thirtieth anniversary of the mm-hmm. force. I think. Yeah, um, <laughs> which we we decided to to go out and do um tour that album as play yeah. the force in its entirety, you know, and that. Yeah. We, we did a world tour and then we did another world tour. Yeah. And it went on for for almost three years. Mm-hmm. For the, sure. the demand to, for that was ridiculous. Yeah. It, it was supposed to be like one tour and, and that was it. And it just went on and on and on. Um, and like I said, we, we toured that nearly two and a half, three years. And it was it was insane. The offers just kept coming in and you don't turn it down. No, from, of course what was happening i mean it was great publicity and the demand was there so we just did it you know yeah. and before you know it time had disappeared it's like label okay it's time for another record and then you gotta write it then yeah of course because i i can't that's one thing i can't do i was thinking about this the other day i can't multitask in in terms of being on the road mm-hmm. and writing the songs and it's it's either or i'm sort of focused on one and not the other yeah, for sure. Um, I, I need to be in that kind of home environment to start writing and stuff, which is obviously you're on a range of not. So yeah. that was hence the long delay. So we put out the um the live of the slaughterhouse album. Mm, of course. Yeah. Um, as a as a kind of stop gap. But um, it, it was still a large gap and, Yeah. Um maybe maybe we should be a little bit more prolific, but then yeah, I, I mean, mean, I mean, it, it was it wasn't a um, it wasn't meant to be a kind of a negative. It was just more of a a curio, yeah, as yeah. I say. When I when I, when yeah. I sort of uh, discovered you guys, I I, I read a bit around uh, 2015, 2016. I went through a, a massive just thrash phase, just trying to find the, all the thrash bands that were exist. Yeah. And I was like, oh my god, this fucking band rule. And then obviously there was nothing till twenty twenty. And I was like, when the <laughs> fuck are they going to release another fucking record? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> so it's pretty much the same with this one as well, one I reckon, because obviously we got the mm. we got this this uh, other album coming out I mentioned earlier, but yeah. then we've got to start writing the next one then. So it's gonna be another eighteen yeah. months or a couple of years. So it's gonna be quite a long gap between that one as well, unfortunately. But um yeah. The situations with the pandemic and, and my injury really hasn't helped. So yeah, absolutely. It's a it's a legitimate excuse. This time. <laughs> that, that's fair. That's fair. I wanted to. Um, I didn't want to touch on it too much, but it's 
Um, the, how did you kind of um, sort of navigate the pandemic as a creative person? Because uh, as a creative person myself, uh, this whole podcast evolved out of the pandemic uh, and not being able to go to do uh, YouTube stuff and festival stuff that I used to do prior to this. But uh, how did you kind of find it and how did you kind of navigate that that situation, that time frame? Um, the first part of it, I got absolutely fucked every day. I was just... Yeah, fair. I think most people did. <laughs> I was depressing. I'm not, I, was, I was drinking so heavily for the first part. It yeah. was ridiculous, the amount of beer I was going for, you know, it was, it was insane. Yeah. Um, but then we had the, um, the album to work on, because we, we, re, we, we were a little naughty, because um, we wanted to get the album out. Um, yeah, of course. We weren't concerned about it being in the pandemic. We thought it was possibly a good thing that we could um, utilize in our favor. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, so we were um, we did some we recorded all the vocals in the pandemic. So mm. I remember traveling up. We recorded just outside London. Yeah. Um, and me and Dave went up, and I remember driving out there, and there was not a car on the road. Yeah, for it sure. Was absolute madness. Like, I mean, people were saying, "Oh, if, if you get spotted by the the, the law, like you're going to get pulled and yeah, and this and that." But we we took a chance. <laughs> we we made it to the studio, like, and the couple of the other guys, the guys who were producing, made it as well. So yeah. we just locked ourselves in there and, and got the vocals done. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so we kind of focused on that, and then then came all the all the press and promotion for that as well, which. It's kind of kept me sane then because we were um we were back in band mode even though we couldn't sort of get out there. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah, it, it was it was good. I mean, I, I enjoyed that side of things when we were locked down. Actually, it was um because you could really focus on everything. So. Yeah, of course, and that that that's the thing as well. I, I kind of. I, I, the reason I asked that question is because looking back at it, you know, when we were in it, it was pretty hellish for a lot of people, and I'm not trying to take anything away from that. But the fact is, like, a lot of people kind of thrived, and a lot of people kind of like said, "Okay, well, fuck my nine to five job and doing the thing. I'm going to go and create my own business, and I'm going to go and do something positive." Yeah. So I'm trying to put, uh, trying to pull positive experiences out of a pretty terrible situation, to be honest. But um, yeah, so that that's kind of that, I guess. But um. Yeah, I mean, it was all right. I mean, I, I kind of look back and I know it, it was horrible us being locked down and we couldn't do certain things, but I did enjoy it in a kind of weird kind of way. Yeah, for so, sure. Yeah, so uh, it was good. I mean, the weather was good as well, I remember. The weather was quite hot when we were locked in. So That is very it, true. You, you could look outside or go out in the garden and it, and it was it was bright and it was kind of cheery, you know, so. Absolutely, yeah. And the thing, the thing that kind of... Um, makes you kind of feel a little bit more at ease i guess is the fact that you said you guys snuck out to go to the studio and things the government yeah. were having fucking parties so you're you've got a free pass on yeah. that one you're all good yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, mean, I mean we we had, we had to do it you know um yeah i don't uh, i think it it was a good inspiration at the time yeah absolutely um i wanted to kind of ask as well looking back at your career is there anything that you would have changed or do differently that you could think of if there is, that's uh, cool as well. Yeah, and any one thing. I mean, obviously, things that happen is what what makes you as a person or makes you as a band. Yeah, of course. Um, the only kind of regret I know we had, especially myself and Steve Grice, was that we signed to London Records. I think that was our mm. biggest mistake. Um, I know Steve didn't really, he wasn't really keen on signing to them. Yeah. Um, he he preferred one of the other labels, which in hindsight, which is a wonderful thing, would have been probably our better option. Yeah. Um, but we that I think that was our big mistake, and I would have liked to have changed that maybe um, because we signed to them, and it was um, probably the wrong label. They were trying to be trendy, trying to take um, get um, a thrash metal band in, in the current climate, you know, because Metallica were were breaking big and yeah. I think they'd licensed uh, Rain and Blood, I think, London Records had, and um, Faith No More album. Mm-hmm. Um, so they wanted a, a band they could sign direct mm. in the UK, and that was us, you know? Yeah. But um, because we didn't sell immediately one million records straight off within like six months, yeah. kind of, they're, they're, they had a pop mentality. They had lots of, you know, like mm. mainstream pop hacks, like, 
Yeah. And because metal doesn't work that way, you need you need to develop bands, and, and they weren't prepared to do that. They wanted the immediate success, you know. And, yeah. And they never. I mean, it was successful for us in terms of sales wise, but it didn't hit their targets. What they were watching Metallica do, you know. And yes. We were well. We need time to do this. Um, we're not going to hit their sales figures straight away. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, I mean that was that was our big mistake. Um, and I think it ultimately led to us breaking up. In the long term, I think the first time around. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's the only thing I kind of regret, really. Yeah, for sure. Um, I wanted to kind of ask as well. Do you are you a man who has the finger of the pulse and kind of the metal and things at the moment, or or are you kind of uh sort of you've got you've got your or your older material and you're happy with that, or how, how do you kind of view music and things nowadays? How how is things mm-hmm. with that? I don't tend to listen to too much new stuff. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm pretty old school. Yeah, for sure. Uh, still. My main love, what I follow, on or bands I go to see are, are punk bands, really. Okay, amazing, nice. And I still see go to see Discharge whenever I can, and bands like GPH and and what have you. And I went to a local pub on the, on the weekend actually to watch one of my mates. He was playing his first show. Oh, amazing, um, nice. After all these years, like his first ever gig, like there's um, a few punk bands playing there. It was a great night out, like, so. Yeah. But um, no, I. <laughs> I mean, we, we know where we come from. I mean, you, you take in a kind of few modern influences, but I don't want us to go to absorb all this new kind of metal styles and, and what have you. Yeah, we, sure. we, know, we know what Onslaught is and we know where we need to stay. And I don't want anything kind of coming into our mm. into our headspace that shouldn't be in there. You know? So I don't, I don't follow too much of the, the new style metal. Yeah, that that's fair. That's totally fair. Um, so I want to obviously um, you've you've had a long and very illustrious career with with onslaught and stuff, uh, and done countless gigs and festivals in your career. Do you have any standout moments from a show or any funny tour or stories, anything like that you can give us? Yeah. Oh, there's been so many. Um, I mean the, the 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 thing that stands out in in our career and really what kind of set us on the road to to where we are was when we toured with Motorhead. Um, mm, for sure. What was that like? Oh, that was it was out of this world. I mean, that was just the force had just come out. Yeah. Um, and then we had a phone call from uh, Music for Nations, our label at the time, said, um, "Right, well, get get your bags packed. You're off on tour with Motorhead for a month in Europe next week." And it's like, wow, really? Yeah. And it was just the whole tour was just out of this world. I mean, we we were pretty young kids then, and they just treated us so well. Um, Amazing. And the fun we had on the tour was just amazing. I remember um, we played the first night in in Zurich, mm-hmm. and um, it it went unbelievably well. Like when we we got back in the d- dressing room after the after the gig, back the door bursts open. Like Lemmy comes in. We haven't even spoken to him yet. Get back up on that fucking stage now. They want more. Like it's like really. It's like fucking. Oh, it, it, and it was just like that. Yeah, all the way through. I mean, probably one of the, the funniest moments ever in in band history. We we were sat in a bar where there was me, uh, Steve Grice, uh, one of our roadies, and Phil mm. Campbell yeah. and Wurzel from Motorhead. It was about four in the morning. We were all drinking. Yeah. Then the the lift comes down. You hear it ding. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. door opens up and Lenny comes out in fucking <laughs> set of paisley pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> Every, everybody just fell about because we were all drunk then and we were just it was like to see Lemmy in a set of paisley pajamas was was unreal like amazing he just looked at it, fuck off you cunts and then got back in the lift and went <laughs> back to bed amazing, amazing. It, was, it, it was unreal like, <laughs> see this iconic guy in a pair of paisley pajamas you know <laughs> absolutely i mean we, we spoke about regret uh just a second ago one of my biggest regrets in life was i never got to see mohead live and when i did go and try and go and see mohead um i was due i was going to download festival 2016 and obviously lemmy passed away uh earlier that year and it was just this thing of just this, this band just come around all the fucking time my mohead were mm. relentless at touring and things and it was always like oh, i'll catch him next time Oh, I'll catch him next time. And now, when a band rolls through that I love or, or you know, admire or whatever, it's like, 
I'm going to go and see them because I don't know when I will, if I will ever again. Do you know what I mean? And it's the one, one sort of thing that really sticks to me. I'm going, yeah, I need to see them live because I haven't and I need to tick them off the list and, and things like that, which kind of um, brings me quite nice on to, to a question where do you have anyone on your bucket list of bands? You know, when, you, when, you're, when you're a kid and you first sort of discover rock and metal and things and you write a list going, I need to see these, need to see these, need to see these. Have you got anyone yeah. left on your list you have either played with or, or want to see live? Um... I mean, we we played with it, so many bands now, um, mm. and we've pretty much covered covered the list um, for sure. from punk bands to metal bands, you know, mm-hmm. even to the playing with the Backstreet Boys, which was kind of, when, kind of bizarre. When, when did this happen? That's amazing. <laughs> you have to tell me this story quickly. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> one of the weirdest ones ever. Um, played a festival in China in 2016. <laughs> it was, uh, I think it was called the Yellow River. International Music Festival or something, right? And we were we were there with the Backstreet Boys. <laughs> that is incredible. And it was um, we <laughs> followed um this um female classical pianist. This yeah, was like really, really beautiful Chinese girl. She she was massive in in China, like yeah. So um, she's she's on the stage and like all the crowd are throwing all these flowers at the end of her set and. I think this is this is gonna be. We're just gonna die here. This is not, not gonna be good. I'm I'm so, just I'm just I've just googled. Uh, it's Ch- Ching Zhang. Sorry, for, 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 about butchered that pronunciation. International Music Festival 2016. Yeah, that's <laughs> fucking mental. I mean, that's really fucking cool. But that's yeah, that's mad. Yeah. Did you get to meet uh, them all? Like, because that's just... no, no, no. <laughs> what a great um, thing. But, but yeah, I mean, this is uh, a huge crowd there and this, this girl finishes a set and we got we're going on after yeah how's this gonna go this is not are we really <laughs> yeah. the right back for this festival you know because mm-hmm. um, we had to pull a few strings or, or bend a few rules to actually get there because of our lyrical content and stuff for sure um so the, the, the stage is lined with police and military yeah. guys no. everywhere like, it's, it's yeah. really weird <laughs> so um we kicked off the set. Yeah. W- within a couple of minutes, there's like crowd surfers and everything going off. Pits. It, it's is insane. All the soldiers and the police are like head banging away. It's like what the fuck's going on in here. It was the China was an amazing tour, but it was so surreal at, at times. Like, you know. I, I have to because it, because it's 2016. I'm gonna have to see if there's some footage on YouTube after we're finished here, <laughs> yeah. and if there is, I'll link it up because that is incredible. I think in the three in the nearly three years of this podcast, that is the best story tour story I've <laughs> ever had. Thank you so much for that. It was fucking incredible. The, 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 I think that something even weirder than that. It was um the last show we did in China. Go on. It was Mother's Day in China. Okay. So um, we we went to the venue uh, to sound check. And the streets were dead because mm. everybody had been out in yeah, the day for lunch and Mother's Day. And the place was dead, and the place was absolutely trash where they had yeah. all these Mother's Day parties. Like, and stuff. So we sound check, went back, and, stuff. and we're all there. Is, is this show going to be worth playing? I don't know because there's, there's nobody on the streets whatsoever. And it was a late one on a Sunday night, I think. Yeah. Um, so the promoter said, go back to the hotel, everything's going to be fine. So we, we came back to the venue about 11 o'clock at night, I think. Um, streets, again, dead, nobody. You're approaching the venue, walking to the venue, it's nothing. It's like, yeah. what the fuck's going on? Is this, shall we do this? Do we do we need to be doing this? To yeah. Sort of end on a low note. But now everything's fine. So we walked into the venue, and the venue's absolutely round. Yeah. <laughs> but um, very kind of strange-looking audience. Yeah. Um. Lots of girls, yeah, um, <laughs> which is quite unusual to have a, a, such a percentage mix of females there. Yeah, of course. Um, so then we kicked off, and the crowd kicked off, and it was there was bodies flying everywhere, and there was just all these girls were just stood at the front of the stage screaming at us, like and like crying, and you know it was like when the Beatles used to be like yeah. it was like that. There's all these girls just like. Oh, just going mental. It was, I've never seen nothing like it. We were, we were all looking at each other. <laughs> What's going on here? And all these blokes' bodies are flying everywhere, stage diving. And 
yeah, so so surreal to see that. And all these girls that. are just like almost on the verge of fainting. Like it's like madness. <laughs> It would would you say because I, I heard I've had a few musicians on who said that it's sort of China Japan is the best place to tour in terms of just because culturally culturally it's so different from anywhere else but also like you say the fans are just a different level of kind of a crazy. <laughs> yeah, I mean we've been to Japan a few times. I mean it's, it's amazing. They love their metal there. Yeah, um, but China, China was a whole new. Yeah, nobody knew what to expect, um, and not many bands have been to China before. Yeah, of course. Um, but as a as an experience of a lifetime, it was absolutely incredible. I'd love to go there again, play some more shows. So, absolutely, but, yeah, absolutely. It, it was right out there. Amazing stuff. Um, I've got a couple more questions before I let you on your way, and I do thank you for your time today. Um, and the first of which is a, a question which. Uh, I feel like the more you buy into it, the better it is. And this will make sense in a second. So um, I am going to become, this is sarcasm for any American listeners because Americans don't get sarcasm, at least British sarcasm anyway. Uh, I'm going to become a massive, huge deal, right? I'm going to have a massive, huge podcast and fucking hundreds of thousands of deals and all that Spotify money coming my way and all the rest of it, right? <laughs> And I'm going to create my own festival, right? And it's going to be called the Nevermind Poly Podcast Festival. And Onslaught, you are 100% invited to play. It's going to be a very eclectic bill of everyone who's appeared on the podcast like your good self. Um, I have one question, and that is, what would you like to add to the rider of said festival? Now, there is no financial restrictions. There is no, <laughs> there is no uh, like logistical constrictions, right? I'll give you the example I always give to everybody. I had uh, the drummer of August Burns Red on, the lovely Matt. He said... I want a full RC like monster truck set up in the back, right? So, what would you like to add? And we've had everyone from um, the a punk guitarist uh, uh, Beans on Toast. He said, "I just want to turn up and play." And I'm like, "Yeah, you're already on the guest list. That's fine. Like, don't worry about that." Um, what would you like to add? Wow, that's that's insane question. <laughs> <laughs> I said I'm a big fan of it. <laughs> I mean, usually I'd say like a couple of bottles of tequila. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the standard. <laughs> I mean, the best one I could say put on there is is the original lineup of Motorhead to be there. <sighs> Fucking go on, nice, nice. Um, so I mean, obviously, Lemmy, Phil, and and Eddie, like you know, yeah, um, they were a massive influence, and they're all sadly gone now. Yeah. So to have that there would be absolutely out of this world for me <laughs> so so i've got two i've got a question to go with that question and it is are we reincarnating lemmy or are we getting a time machine and just going to pop back and get him and then once he's done we can put him back to sleep and uh, he'll, he'll be resting we'll again. time machine, I think. Time machine. <laughs> yeah not not reincarnated <laughs> <laughs> no, because you couldn't ever recreate what he was like. Uh, him and Phil, in particularly. Um, I mean, I've met Eddie a couple of times, but I, I knew them guys. Yeah, it, I'd like to think we're friends in the end, you know. Yeah, um, and you you could never recreate recreate them two madmen. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, and I have one final question, which I've asked every uh, artist and every guest who's been on this podcast, like your good self. And it's a fairly simple question, but the the answer is important to you. And you could say whatever you uh, feel at this moment in time. And that is, what is the best thing about being in a band slash being a musician, in your opinion? So you can go super profound with it, or you can be something super simple. I had a, um, a guitarist of a death metal band who just said, absolutely nothing. He just went, nothing. Which is, he did give you a proper answer, but it's just like great, which is great comedy. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, that's, that's the simple one for me because I love to travel, mm -hmm. um, Fair. and to be able to be able to travel the world and go and meet so many fantastic people and, and experience so many different cultures is just really? a real honour for me. You know? um, I think I think when we carried we we played something like seventy four different countries around the world. Amazing. Um, so to meet all those incredible people and, and see some of the incredible sights we've seen and some of the things are completely insane or what's happened when we're there, like, you know, so you, you just couldn't buy it. However, even if you were Elon Musk, if you were um, Richard Branson, whoever you are, you could never buy what Onslaught have had in those 40 odd years as a band. Yeah, you, you just couldn't. There's no way you can buy it because money can't buy that experience. 
Absolutely. I love that. That's a perfect end to the podcast. Thank you so much, Nigel. I've got one final thing, and that is uh, what's ahead in 2023. Obviously, you're in recovery at the moment, and we wish you all yeah. the well with that. Um, I, I guess that's the, the next thing, isn't it? Focusing on health and, and getting better. And then, um, yeah. yeah, is there anything we should be looking out for in 2023-24? Well, obviously, this um, the double album I mentioned earlier. Um, yeah, of course. Um, a lot of it depends on my recovery, really. We're, we're being a little careful with the with the bookings. Yeah, of course. Well, we're just winding up the summer festivals up until August now. Um, yeah. And we, I don't think we've got anything booked um, after that. For now, just seeing how my recovery goes. But um, obviously, album's going to be planned, as I said, later this year or early 24. Yeah, absolutely. Which hopefully, we can be full steam ahead then and get back to our usual busy hard working selves absolutely love it absolutely love it is there anything you want to say to the people listening at home watching on youtube and all the rest of it uh, i would just say thank you for all the support over all the years you've been incredible um i mean i think we very rarely get many negative comments from, mm. from our fans you know and, and they've been with us along the way yeah. brought a lot of new young fans in as well which is amazing and they've all bought into the the history of the band and uh, you just can't thank these people enough you know because without them you're nothing absolutely love that absolutely love it no it's just been a fucking pleasure to sit down with my friend if you want to come on for a part two once the album's complete yeah. with things you're more than welcome as i say i could pick okay. your brains all day about uh stories of lemmy and backstreet yeah, boys yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I really enjoyed that man thank you lovely stuff uh this has been the nevermind poly podcast with me matt you uh you guys listen at home and nige of onslaught we will see you very soon peace out, everybody peace out see you soon Ta-ta. bye